Well, thank you, Eric. It is a joy and privilege to be with you, although a little awkward to be introduced here in light of uh, our history. It kind of feels like you're being introduced to your parents in your old home. <laughs> But then I look out and I don't know a lot of you, uh, which is uh, both a little sobering and also uh, incredibly encouraging because you all who have filled in the gaps that we left are an answer to prayer. And uh, it is always going to be a joy to be back here. And Grace Bible Church is always in our prayers. We are overwhelmingly thankful for you all and the ministry that you do and have done in the way that we benefit from that. Oftentimes, when we were moving towards planting uh, Gilbert Bible Church, and I would have discussions with other pastors and others who have participated in church planting endeavors and works, it was described to me that when you plant a church, you go wander in the wilderness for a while. And it's a unique hardship that requires incredible endurance and faithfulness to go plant a church. And what's interesting and really a kindness of the Lord is that our experience has been the complete opposite. Uh, it has been invigorating. It has been joyful. It has been fruitful uh, in all the ways that we would hope. And as we rejoice in the work that the Lord is doing in Gilbert Bible Church, we know that that is a direct result of the work that the Lord has been doing through Grace Bible Church. And because this church has and has had faithful pastors who were committed to equipping men for ministry, uh, Tom Engstead uh, has been a part of this church in its history and is a part of Gilbert Bible Church as one of our pastors. Tyler, Tyler Azeltine, many of you know him, is a pastor now at Gilbert Bible Church and is serving so faithfully. I was raised up, as Eric said, in this church, uh, being equipped, training men for pastoral ministry. Uh, every single elder in this church has contributed to our equipping and uh, not only that, but what has really been astounding is the equipping of the saints through the pastoral ministry and reciprocal care of this church for one another that has led to the members of Gilbert Bible Church really thriving in ministry as a relatively new church. We're two and a half years in, and so the report is good. Uh, there is so much gratefulness, and we give praise to God for you. We think and pray for you often as a church. And uh, we boast in the Lord's grace in your lives and kindness to us through all of you. So my encouragement is, first of all, praise the Lord with us for his work and keep doing the things that you're doing. They are important. And even as we've heard this morning, this church's unwavering commitment to steward the gospel faithfully by equipping saints for the work of ministry, that they would then be sent out, whether it's Mary Roro or NOLA, or all the way to Southeast Gilbert. <laughs> the Lord is working, and it's, it's wonderful, and it's a privilege to be a part of, and it is certainly, certainly a privilege to be with you all. Our family is forever grateful for the love that we have received and the care that we have received and continue to receive from you all. So with that in mind, let us pray and we will direct our attention to the one who is the giver of all of these good things and the one um, with whom we love and serve, and that is our Savior. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning. Thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to be with these dear friends and brothers and sisters. Thank you for the work that you are doing in their lives. Thank you for their endurance and perseverance and ministry and faithfulness to you. Thank you for their robust love for you and for one another and how that manifests itself in so many different ways. And as we direct our attention to your word, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us all the more, that we would be useful all the more for your purposes. Lord, I pray that the truths of who you are and what you have done in Christ and what you continue to do for your people would fortify and strengthen us in our pursuit of living for your glory above all else, even when it's hard. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please open your Bible to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. As a church at Gilbert Bible Church, uh, just a little update. We are uh, 
kind of on a slow, steady pace of growth, which has been really great because the new people coming into the church are getting plugged in deeply, deeply rooted, serving part of fellowship groups. Our men's, women's ministry is called EQ. It's similar to Build and Wellspring here. Uh, people are participating and, and it has just been such an encouragement to see the work that the Lord is doing. We're continuing to meet on Saturday nights at Discovery Community Church. Uh, we are saving our money. We are trying to save our money. Um, as the Lord is providing and searching for a building of our own or a more permanent residence that would allow us to move to Sunday mornings. But for now, this is what the Lord has for us. And we're thankful for that. And in fact, discovery, their hospitality has been so overwhelming that it, it has just been a wonderful gift and provision from the Lord to enable so much ministry, even beyond our corporate gathering. And, and we're thankful for that. Although I did see the building next door is for sale. So maybe we can <laughs> just check it. <laughs> We won't do that, okay? We won't go back to being Gilbert Bible Church of Tempe. We're gonna stay in, gonna stay in Gilbert. But what we've been doing is we, we just recently finished our time through First Peter. I preached through all of First Peter and it had profound impact on me personally, but also for our church. And I hope to be able to spill over a little bit uh, the fruit of what God has done in our lives over these last uh, several months as we've worked through that. We live in a bent and broken world. We know this. Sin is present and death, sickness and sorrow and pain. And there is suffering and hardship that we inevitably navigate in this world. And for those who are in Christ, there's oftentimes increased affliction in persecution as we share in the sufferings of Christ. And it is a privilege to do so. Not easy to do so, but it is a privilege to join in those sufferings with Christ. We can find ourselves being persecuted, maligned, slandered, and ridiculed, all for our devotion to our Savior. And yet the Lord has not been stingy in his provision to his people to endure such things. And not only to endure hardships and trials, but to actually thrive in the midst of those hardships and trials as we navigate them under his grace. How do we do that? How do we not merely get through the hardship, but worshipfully endure and thrive and grow? That should be the aim for each one of us who is in Christ. When I was in my early teen years, we got a Great Dane puppy. They start out relatively small or maybe normal dog sized. And they quickly increase in size to horse like size. She became well over 100 pounds. And one day I had this idea that it would be so fun to use her as a sled dog of types and to put on my rollerblades and have her pull me around the neighborhood. For the young ones, this is not an endorsement of this, especially for the older ones, don't try this. Uh, but I put on her leash and uh, we went outside and she took off. It was awesome. <laughs> Went down our long driveway. She turned, started running down the street. I'm on my rollerblades. It's great until she uh, had something catch her attention in the neighbor's grass to the right. And she took off that way and with no way to control or stop her. Uh, rollerblades and grass don't mix very well. And uh, yet her profound strength dragged me through the grass. And as she was dragging me through the grass, I had this realization that I need to figure out a way to control her. <laughs> And so with my youthful ingenuity and the fact that we had horses, I knew, hey, if we could have kind of some, some sort of halter for her and I could control her head, but still keep tension on the collar, then she could run full speed, but I could control where she went. So we got a halter for her. And I don't know what my parents were thinking. I don't know why they, <laughs> why they let me do this, but I guess there were worse things I could have been doing. And so we put the halter on her and I took the end of the leash where there's the loop and I looped that through her collar. So I had kind of a, a system where she could pull me with one end and I could direct her head with the other. That became the pinnacle of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun because what I, what I found was that she needed to be under control and the way to control her was by having control over her head. Where her head went, the rest of her would go. We see this even illustrated in scripture in James, right? Uh, a small rudder controls the ship. Bits in horses' mouths direct the whole beast. 
Well, listen, it is similar for us. Where your head is at, where your thinking is at, is where you will go in life. What you believe will have a direct impact on how you live, on how you endure, on how you persevere, on how you trust. And so what we actually believe, what we set our thoughts on, what we set our minds to will inevitably have a profound impact on every other part of our life. Peter knows this. And that's why throughout the whole book, he has been putting forth incredible truth about Christ to stabilize the believers, to to fortify the believers in their faith so that they would stand firm in the midst of the inevitable persecution and trials that awaited them. If you can control your mind, if you can control your thinking, it will impact your whole life. You see, navigating life for the glory of God is not so much about you controlling what is going on outside of you, although that is usually where we want to start. Things externally happened around me. Things happened to me. And I want to control those things. And God calls us as his children to not so much address those things that are happening, happening around and to us, but to address what is going on within us. And he gives us the grace to do so. And that's really our, our only hope that he would give us that grace. How do you think about the afflictions in your life? If our thinking impacts where the rest of us go, and if in Christ, especially there are hardships and trials and afflictions that await us, how are you thinking today about the hardships that the Lord has brought into your life, has allowed to come into your life, has ordained for your life? Peter throughout the entire book has been helping his audience with this, giving rich theology and practical instruction and putting forth truth after truth about the gospel and Jesus and his ministry and his example. And here in our section this morning, we are in his closing statements. And as he leads into his final closing of the letter, he's going to put forth such a powerful truth in such a succinct manner that has profoundly consequential implications for your life. If you will but believe it and embrace it and renew your mind with it. He really is going to put forth an unwavering hope for the believer that is a buoy for you in affliction. That has been the context of this book. In fact, Peter tells us in verse 12 of chapter 5 why he wrote it. Like Denny shared from John, John gave us his thesis statement late in his book. Peter is doing that also here where he tells them that he's writing so that they may stand firm in the true grace of God. And what should most concern us as we navigate the difficulties and hardships of our life is that we would remain faithful to God, that we would stand firm in the midst of affliction and hardship and persecutions and trials and the grace that God has lavished upon us. These truths that Peter puts forth here are certainly for times of persecution and hardship, but these truths have such a dramatic and profound impact on how we live every day of our life for Christ. And so let's look at our verses together for this morning, starting in verse 10. We're just going to look at verse 10 and 11 primarily this morning. Peter writes, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, here Peter puts forth three realities that fortify the believer amid suffering. Three realities that fortify the believer amid suffering. Three truths that stabilize the Christian in the midst of the trials and difficulties of this life. This life is filled with hardships and trials and difficulties. And Peter in our passage sets before us three, three realities that strengthen the believer in the midst of navigating those various hardships. Now, as I said just a moment ago, the context of what Peter has been addressing is namely around persecution for following Jesus. 
That is what these early believers were facing, horrendous, escalating persecution because of their association with Christ. But these truths, if you can know them and embrace them and believe them, it will create such a a comfort and a peace and a courage and even a means of finding joy in your suffering, regardless of the source of the suffering. You can have peace and comfort and joy in the midst of your affliction. Not all suffering is a result of persecution. Yet for the believer, we should certainly expect persecution because of our association with Christ. However, it is important to note that sometimes we suffer as a result of our own sin and foolishness. Sometimes we suffer as a result of others' sin against us or around us. Sometimes we suffer simply because we live in a fallen world. Things like sickness, death, physical limitations, hardships, these things oftentimes come just as a result of sin entering the world and death entering because of it. However, regardless of the catalyst of your suffering, what the Christian can be assured of is that every moment of suffering as a Christian, regardless of what has brought it about in your life, has divine purpose behind it and can be responded to in a way that glorifies God. And that should be the aim for each of us. And so Peter at the end of this letter is closing it out with these absolutely amazing realities that we must keep coming back to. These are foundational encouragements for the Christian life. These are truths that we must come back and shepherd our heart with back time and time again, reminding ourselves of these things. And as opportunity allows, reminding one another of these things and encouraging each other of these things. So Peter addresses three areas that at times, especially in hard times, can be easy to forget. It is that your suffering is temporary, your glory is secure, and God's power is eternal. And when trials hit and you are in suffering, what is the feeling that we oftentimes experience? Will it ever end? Will this hardship ever be removed? What do we question? Will I get through this? Will I persevere? I want to give up. Is it really worth it to keep following Christ in the midst of my affliction? What are we tempted to question? God, are you really in control? Are you really doing a work in this and through this? Are you really good? Is there really purpose behind my suffering? Does God really have power in my affliction? I mean, he's a good God. If he's good and he has power, he wouldn't allow this to come into my life. He wouldn't bring this issue into my life. That's what we're tempted oftentimes to think and question. And yet Peter heads off all of these objections with such profound truth and clarity. And so let's look together first. The first reality that fortifies the believer amid suffering is this. Your suffering is temporary. Your suffering, if you are in Christ, is temporary. Look at verse 10. Peter says, after you have suffered for a little while. A little while. And Peter brings forth the reality that suffering is part of the Christian life. And that is a running theme of the book. If you just took a cursory reading of the book of 1 Peter, you would see time and time again the theme of trials and hardship and suffering. And that is the theme of 1 Peter, and really the New Testament puts that forth repeatedly. Suffering in this life is inevitable for the Christian. Uh, just listen to what Peter has already stated up to this point in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Chapter, verse, or chapter 2, verse 21, For you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. Chapter 3, verse 14, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. 
Chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Jesus himself tells his disciples in John 15, 18, and 19. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this. The world hates you. On and on, the reality and expectation for the believer in this life is that there is suffering for Jesus. And yet Peter says, after you have suffered for a little while, a little while, I love that. There is suffering for the Christian in this life, but in your suffering, there is an end in sight. There is an end in sight. Sure does not feel that way. And yet that is often all we want in our suffering. Just make it Stop. It's oftentimes so hard to endure, just end my suffering. We face all sorts of suffering and hardship, do we not? Hardship in work and toil, hardship in family relationships, estranged family members, broken relationships, hardships in marriage. Difficulties, struggles, hardships in parenting, hardships in health, hardships in sorrows, hardships in relationships in general. And so often our disposition can be primarily, God, when will you end this for me? Is there an end in sight? And yet, Oftentimes, that is not how God answers those pleas. Why? Why would he not just remove it now? Well, because every moment of suffering is ordained by God and is meaningful in the believer's life. And yet, rest assured, it is temporary. Your suffering for Christ, your suffering in Christ, is both necessary and temporary. That is a comfort. That is a comfort because God uses those very trials we want out of to produce the very things he says next that he assures us he will accomplish in those who are his. That's why James could say, consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because those various trials we naturally balk against are God's means of grace to humble us, mature us, grow us, sanctify us, and ultimately bring us into glory. Paul echoes this in Romans 8, 18. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. It's no contest. Uh, The contrast isn't even comparable. Uh, Your sufferings in this life compared to what awaits you in eternal glory are completely different categories. To try to compare those things makes no sense because they are so dramatically different. This doesn't minimize how hard things are today, right? Hard things are still hard. Trials are still trials. Challenges are still challenging. Pain is still painful. But what does this reality do? It testifies to the beauty and wonders of what awaits the believer. However hard your hardship is, only testifies to how wonderful eternity is for the believer. Because whatever intensity of hardship you are in today, it pales. It's not even comparable to the glory that awaits the believer. 
It's like Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Your suffering will end. The glory in eternity will endure forever. Think about that. Every moment of suffering in this life, God is using to increase your joy in eternity. Every single moment of suffering the believer endures is meaningful and purposeful. There's no wasted suffering in your life. There's no moment of suffering or affliction or pain that the Lord doesn't see or turns his eyes away from or doesn't know about or isn't using. He uses it all. And in eternity, you will not regret one moment of hardship in this life. That is how amazing the eternal glory that the Lord has for his children is in contrast to the momentary suffering we experience now for a little while. For a little while. Listen, in your sorrows and struggles, do you ever just feel exhausted? Worn down? Faint hearted? Like all the wind is out of your sail. I've got nothing left. First of all, there's a discipline in this for each one of us. When I have felt most burdened in my trials, it's when I'm looking beyond today, trying to bear the weight of my anticipated bearing of trials of whatever that may look like for the rest of my life. So there's a discipline to restrain your thinking, to just be faithful today. Like Jesus says in the sermon on the Mount to not worry about tomorrow. Today has enough troubles of its own, but to trust him, he'll give you what you need today. But in those moments where you just feel like the weight of hardship is crushing upon you, maybe you struggle to even get out of bed because you know, the hardship that awaits you. What do you do with that? If you are in Christ, that suffering that the Lord has for you that day, it is only for a little while. It has an end date determined by God. It's just for a little while. And what is one year or 10 years or 50 years or 100 years in contrast to 5,000? Or five million. Or five billion for that matter. Or eternity. And yet growing weary in our sorrows is a very real temptation. Maybe you can relate to this. I've I've found myself at times in sorrows, disheartened, wondering, could I just have some joy without it mixed with sorrows? Can you relate to that? Something hard in your life has happened. Something difficult is going on in your life right now. And even the joys of life, while being incredibly sweet, are coinciding with hardship, sorrow, difficulty. You might even look at the world around you and everybody is lighthearted and joyful. And you want to enter into that joy. You want to enter into that lighthearted moment. And yet the weight of past struggles, hardships, Maybe even your own sin and sorrow over that or sin done against you and difficulty in that or current hardships that you're navigating, broken relationships, whatever it may be, feels like it's, it's contaminating or pressing in on that joy that you just want to experience in that moment. First of all, we need to agree with God with what he says about our trials. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But you also can find comfort knowing that while you may never experience that kind of unmixed joy in this life, there is a day coming that will endure in eternity where there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more grief, no more suffering. Little spoiler alert, Revelation chapter 21. I know Smed is taking you through that now, but just listen for a moment. 
Revelation 21 verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the uh, spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. What a comfort. What a comfort. The sufferings that can so dominate our attention and at times even our lives now, Paul said, are are not even worthy to be compared with what is coming. They're not in the same category, not in the same discussion when considering what is to come. Doesn't that make you long for heaven? Doesn't it make you amazed and grateful for what God has done to secure you in Christ? Peter says, after you have suffered for a little while. He uses this word little. It's relatively small in number, small on the scale, short, minuscule, tiny, just a little bit. Is that how you think about your suffering? It is temporary, has an end date, and it is purposeful. Next, the next reality that fortifies the believer in suffering is not only that your suffering is temporary, but the complementing reality is also that your glory is secure. That's number two for us this morning. Your suffering is temporary, and in that temporary suffering, if you are in Christ, your glory is secure. Look at verse 10, the second half, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. What will he do? Will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Your suffering is temporary. It has an end date. And yet your glory, if you are in Christ, is secure. Peter says, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, first of all, What a wonderful title for God, the God of all grace, all grace. He is the source and the giver of all grace, all undeserved favor that is lavished upon us. Even though we deserve none of it, he gives us all sorts of grace, all categories of grace, grace for every occasion, every trial, every hardship, every circumstance that we navigate in life. His grace has no bounds. There are no areas of your life that his grace cannot meet. He is the God of all grace. And Peter says this God with all kinds of grace for every need and every occasion who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. That's what God did. If you are in Christ, he called you. This calling isn't simply an offering, but it is his choosing of you. It is an effectual calling, his saving of you, his granting to you faith. And it is his regenerating work to bring you from spiritual death to spiritual life. It is his saving you from the condemnation that you deserved in your sin against him. It is his reconciling you to himself through the blood of Christ. It is his lavishing his love upon you. When you are a godless, helpless sinner, that God of all grace who called you to himself. The same God, Peter says, who called you, he himself will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And we'll talk about these terms in a moment. But this is God's personal care and ministry to you, even through and in your sufferings. You see, your afflictions are not an obstacle to the work God is doing in you. How could you ever question the provision and adequacy of his grace in your suffering if you remember his grace in your salvation? 
If you renew your mind with the truth of the gospel and what you deserve before him in your sin, in your transgressions against him, in your rebellion against him, how much more can you have confidence that he will give you what you need as his child in your hardship? We can have all the confidence in the world. We shouldn't question his provision or the adequacy of his grace in our suffering when we remember that the same God who called you to trust him in your suffering is the same God who called you to his eternal glory at the cost of his own son dying in your place, taking on himself the wrath that you deserved in your sin. This is how we can know that God has divine purpose in every trial and in every suffering. God is personally attending to you with grace and has purpose, enduring purpose for you as he is working and accomplishing his good purposes in you and through you. Which that in itself should just take our breath away that he would not only save us, but bring us into his body, into his church, into the work that he is doing in this world for his glory. This is God's kindness to us. He has good purposes and Every suffering is ordained by God, tailor-made by God to maximize his glory through you and to bring about your greatest good in him. Peter wants our hearts and our minds to go to this reality when suffering. God called you to his eternal glory. It is secure and it is secured by God himself. He did this. He did this. Not only were you called unto salvation, but called unto eternal glories that are to follow. And we get to bask in those for all eternity, giving worship to him for them. And so God calls you with his glorious grace. You will suffer in this life and yet his grace will uphold you and work in you in your suffering. And he's doing it for a purpose to accomplish things in your life as he himself will perfect, confirm, strengthen and establish you. And rapid fire, Peter throws out these terms and not one is given without intentional precision. And Peter starts with he himself will perfect this word for perfect. It's to put back into order. Uh, You were born into sin. You lived in that sin. And in your being called by God, Jesus puts back into order your life. He restores you into a right relationship with him. He causes you to function as you were intended to, to worship him and glorify him. And all that was damaged about you because of your sin, he restores it and puts it back together. And now where you were once a slave to sin and unrighteousness, you are a slave to Christ and you can glorify God and obey him and bring glory to him with your life. Maybe you feel that way at times where in your battle against sin, you just wonder, why am I so broken? Why do I keep reverting back to this old way of life? Why do I sin this way? Why do I cause this kind of damage in my life and to others? And yet, if you are truly in Christ, he is going to put all of you back together again. He is in process of that now, and it will come to complete fruition and glory. The ESV says he will restore you instead of perfect. That's a good, good translation. Both are very good translations. And he is accomplishing this, not in spite of your suffering. He's actually doing this through your suffering. And think of the perspective this brings when you direct your heart to this truth and your suffering. Lord, you are putting me back in order through this affliction so that I will submit, be humbled before you, uh, trust you, worship you, not live for myself, not live in my own wisdom. All of those things are for our good to be put back into order that way. God is doing this restorative work in you through your afflictions. He's doing that now in this life. He's moving you closer. And as I said, it will be complete and in fullness when you are with him in glory. And then next, Peter says, confirm. He himself will confirm. Uh, This is to fix firmly in place. 
It's to establish or support or strengthen you. And every hardship God is using to establish, establish you or to strengthen you or support you in your faith, each trial you persevere in makes you more stable for what is to come. That's what he's doing. Even in chapter one, Peter got at this in talking about the trials and the fiery ordeal that's among you, testing your faith, proving it genuine, which the believer as their faith is proven as genuine to themselves, is more precious than gold. Perseverance through trial reflects God's grace and work in your life, which increases confidence in God's work in your life, which produces more perseverance through more trial. That's the kindness of the Lord, that he would do that work in us, that he would allow us to have confidence of his work in us. That is a blessing for the believer. It strengthens us. Fortifies us. And that's what he gets to next. He says he will strengthen So in your suffering, God is restoring what sin has damaged. He's stabilizing you or fixing you more firmly in your faith and then strengthening you. That is increasing your usefulness and endurance, making more of an impact for his glory, being more effective for usefulness in Christ's purposes. This is what he does. Oftentimes we think about trials the opposite way. Boy, I feel so weak in my trials. And yet God here is using your trials to strengthen you. Why? Because in your trials, you can't fake it. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. So who, to whom do you look? God's strength. Listen, we don't, we don't want to conjure up our own strength to get through trials or hardships or the difficulties of this life. How hopeless would that be? We want God to strengthen us. And God strengthens us most when we come to the greatest end of ourselves. We run to him and he is faithful. Then he says, and establish you. That is a a security at the deepest level. You become immovable in your face. Immovable in your face. Oh, goodness. (laughs) I had to have something like that. At least I didn't say my favorite theologian, Paul Bunyan. I've grown a lot. I've grown a lot. Oh. Establish you in your faith. You become immovable in your faith. It's an unshakable foundation. It is ultimate security in who you are in Christ. When you see God work in your life, when there is no other explanation, but that he is doing that work, you can't point to anything in yourself and say, well, I'm here because I did this. All you can boast is, boast in is, I'm here because God did this work. You will never be more secure. You'll never be more secure. And obviously we know that the believer who has repented of faith in Christ and been brought from spiritual death to spiritual life, who has been reborn because of the regenerating work of God through Christ, that one is secure. We're not talking about losing your salvation. We're talking about for the believer, there is a confidence in God's work in you that produces an emboldened obedience to him. When trials come and you are threatened to wonder, will I make it? When you persevere and you see God strengthen and fortify you and perfect you, mature you, when you see that transpire, you have confidence in God's work in you. And that is a blessing. Why? Because you realize that your suffering and trials are not obstacles to what the Lord is intending to do in you. They are his kind means. They are his divinely ordained and designed personal care and means of making you more like Jesus. Well, lastly, Peter bursts into this brief phrase of praise that demonstrates our last point, And it is that God's power is eternal. So your suffering is temporary. Your glory is secure and God's power is eternal. God's power is eternal. Look at verse 11. To him be dominion 
forever and ever. Amen. This is consequential and immensely comforting. Uh, Not only is God, God over your suffering and guarantees that it is temporary. And not only does he have purpose in your suffering and grace for you to lavish on every situation to accomplish his wonderful spiritual realities in you, securing you as his child, but he possesses ultimate power to accomplish everything exactly according to his will. Peter says to him, be dominion. And as we typically think of dominion, this doesn't fully capture what Peter is doing here in the original language in the Greek. Peter literally says to him, the resident strength to him, all the power. He's not only the supreme power, but God is the source of all power. Think about that. There is nothing that happens outside of God's ultimate authority. And this ultimate authority is forever and ever. It is eternal. This isn't a battle between two foes. One has this amount of power and one has this amount of power. Good thing because this one will win. God has all the power. Every power that we see that doesn't look like it's God's power, is delegated power. It is subjected power to God's power. He has all the power, all the power. Think about that. Every single thing in your life is under the sovereign reign of God who holds all the power. No rogue circumstances, no rogue molecules, no rogue circumstances. He has it all forever. He doesn't take naps. He doesn't go on vacation. Sadly, I love naps. I think he might enjoy one. He doesn't do it. (laughs) He doesn't go on vacation. I love vacation. That's good that I'm not God. He has all the power, all the time for all eternity. That is the God we serve. That is the God over your life, over your salvation, over your trials, over your temptations, over your disappointments, all of them. He has all the power forever. Amen. Don't you just want to worship him? Yes. And we get to now. How sweet is that? What a gift. And yet we can so easily be dismayed, disheartened. We can question God's purposes, his control. We can even go so far as to question his character in our affliction. How dare we? Don't go there. He is sovereign. He is good. He is righteous. He is holy. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. And he has all the power. And yet God cares for us personally. He has all the power and he loves you personally. Cares for you intimately. And Peter says he is using the exertion of his power in the midst of trials and hardships, persecutions to secure you, strengthen you, restore you, and increase your usefulness. And even though it may at times be so overwhelming, it is all temporary. The hardships and your glory for eternity is secure as he is doing these things in you and through you. All power and all might is his forever. As we close this morning, we must realize one thing, especially these realities that your suffering is temporary and that your glory is secure and that God's power is eternal only fortify you. They are only comforts. They are only ultimately true for you as a comfort. If you're in Christ, These things that are wonderful comforts and boldening realities for those who are his children should be utterly terrifying to you if you are not in Christ. Why? Because if you are not in Christ, 
this morning, your suffering is not temporary. It is only getting started. And you will suffer for all eternity under the just righteous wrath of God for your sin, appropriately so, unless you repent and believe. And there is no glory that awaits waits you. And there is no security for you in this life. You are building your life on sand. And when trials and hardships come and they will come, you will be shattered by them. And the comfort for the believer that God holds all the power that is so wonderful as his child is terrifying as his enemy. Whatever power you think you hold over your life, whatever direction you think you can force upon yourself, whatever pleasures you think are yours for the taking, you are subjected to a holy God and you will give an account. And so I would plead with you, if you do not know Christ, come to him. Why would you not, after hearing what you have heard this morning, what is there to hold on to better than what is offered to you in Christ? Forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to God, new life, hope, joy, peace, purpose, eternity secured meaningful living for the glory of God, freedom from sin's bondage. I would love to talk with you. I know the elders, I'm sure anyone who believes in the gospel would be thrilled to talk to you this morning about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. For those who are in Christ, we, we need this. We need to remember this. Whatever season you are in now, give thanks to God. Trust him. Don't wait for the trials to hit to diligently renew your heart and your mind with these truths. Why? Because where your mind is in relation to faith in these realities, in faith in the character of God, your life will go. And so we must fix our hearts and minds on these wonderful realities these wonderful evidences of the personal love and care of God that he has for his children. Let's pray together. Well, heavenly father, <clears throat> we give thanks to you for your love for us. We give thanks to you for this truth. We give thanks to you for your good divine intention and purpose for your children. We thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, if we were Messiah believing individuals at the foot of the cross, looking at that momentary circumstance, we would have had no explanation of how you would use that for good. The son of God hanging on a cross being mocked and scorned and pierced and bruised and beaten, unrecognizable. And yet you used that most atrocious, sinful event in all of human history to bring about the greatest good through the salvation of all who would believe. And so, Lord, we don't always have a clear explanation of why the road or path that you mark out for us personally is the right road or why the circumstances and hardships that we navigate are good, what intention you have in them. But Lord, we trust and we know your character. We know that you have the resident strength, all the power. And so we look to you and we believe and we trust. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to remain steadfast. Help us to endure. Give us perseverance. Give us joy. Help us to not merely get through the hardships of life, but help us to thrive worshipfully, boasting in your goodness in all of life's hardships. And I know this dear body has endured many, many hardships. And even now, my beloved brothers and sisters are navigating da daily weights and just heartbreaking circumstances. Would you uphold them through your divine power and make much of yourself in these things? And we ask in Jesus name. Amen.